Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. My eyes did not look at you with hatred, the blonde said, looking at her newborn daughter. An orderly walking by angrily scut the blonde. Oh my God, aren't you ashamed to talk like that? She's an innocent child. The nurse left and the young mother again looked into the serene face of her daughter and repeated in a whisper, my eyes would not look at you. And she burst into tears. Life was ruined at the root, a golden 22 years. And here she lies, sleeping, yes, sniffling. This little girl's wonderful, all around charming daddy owned a diner down the road. He was a practical man. Did I promise you anything? No. Well, you can solve your own problems. Ashole, she shouted. Don't expect me to give you your car back. You gave it to me, so I'll keep it, Ashole. You can drive it for all I care. He smiled. And Wendy, not from anger at his carefree complacency, wanted right now to take and run over him, this very car. And in the women's clinic, she was so tortured with a referral for abortion that when the coveted paper was in her hands, it was as useful as a bridge along the river. Get out! The gynecologist bellowed at her. Couldn't you come earlier? I couldn't. The pregnant woman said, They wouldn't give me a referral. They kept dragging and dragging. How could I come earlier? You couldn't come before, and you can't come now either. Get out of here. And then there was a friend who said something about a grandmother who lives in the suburbs, but can help. If you bring her money and food at once and promise to keep quiet. The grandmother lived in a private house somewhere on the outskirts of the suburbs and in general was not distinguished by politeness either. How long has it been? She asked angrily and having heard the answer, repeated what the gynecologist had already said. What else have you got in mind? What perhaps told you that the grandmother is ancient to think long ago forgot to think. I've been a gynecologist for 30 years. She's here, and she's flapping her eyes. Do you realize why you're here? It's a full-fledged surgical operation. Where did you go before, you slutty bimbo? We went back to town in silence. Don't be so sad. My friend comforted me. Maybe it will somehow dissolve itself. Yeah, in three months. Gloomily replied the girl, Maybe it will not dissolve, but a baby is also not bad. You have to have a baby sometime. They say it rejuvenates the body. Yes, rejuvenates, and cabbage also grows breasts. No tenderness and love for the child he did not feel, and he, as if sensing this, and tormented the future mother, incessant nausea, edema, and low blood pressure. On top of all, pure maiden skin, now covered with pimples, and do not want to look at themselves in the mirror. But if I had to, it ended with a flood of tears and fierce self-loathing. I'm ugly. She repeated in horror, looking at her blurred figure. There is no waist left at all. And what kind of legs have become? Thick as an elephant's. Her ankles are swollen, now they're as big as her knees, and her breasts are as big as a peasant's. Wendy used to be proud of her chiseled, delicate figure. She was glad that she could eat everything she wanted and not gain a single gram of extra weight. And her hair? That used to be so lush long, like a mermaid, but now they split so that I had to cut them off by 20 centimeters. And for some reason it always looks dirty, as it often does. Think of the baby. Everyone around them was yelling. Did Wendy feel like screaming? Yeah, why? Why should I think of this baby? I didn't want it, and I don't want it. I'm only going to have a baby because they wouldn't give me an abortion referral for a long time. And you, like crazy people, think about the baby, think about the baby. Think for yourselves, if you're so smart.
With endless tears and worries, Wendy brought the situation to the point that right from the next examination in the consultation, she was taken directly to the maternity hospital for preservation. Her blood pressure was so high that she had to spend a whole day on a bed in intensive care under a drip. But the labor was a breeze. Wendy had no time to be frightened. The midwife was already showing her daughter. What a beauty you have. Look at her. She looks just like her mom. But the mother did not want to look, closed her eyes, and even turned her head the other way just in case. Well, well. Roughly encouraged her midwife. It happens, nothing. You will sleep, recover, and love will cover. Nothing, you will still be happy about your daughter, you will. She wasn't happy. Not then, not later. Never at all. The girl did not sleep at night, and the mother spent hours at the crib, shaking it. For some reason, it was unpleasant for her to take the child in her arms. And all these sleepless nights, half asleep, tired days, in her head, she had only one persistent thought. Why didn't I leave her in the maternity hospital? By now I would be free as the wind again. It was a shame to realize that life was passing her by. There were sunny spring days, and if it were not for my daughter, you could go for a walk, watch a new movie, eat a fruit ice cream, not hurrying somewhere in the park. And the money? How much money was now spent on a screaming child that no one wanted, not the father or the mother? Wendy bit her lip to keep from screaming in anger every time she went into the store. If she were free, she could buy everything here, or almost everything, and certainly that black dress and the scarlet shoes, the perfume that had just come into fashion. She'd stop looking in any stores at all, except for groceries to avoid getting upset. I'm a klutz, with despair, thought the young mother, a wretched, half-impoverished, half-needed plutchin. Wendy was firmly convinced that from now on her life would be a dull crawl from the playground to the store and home. Every day, all the time, forever, and without mercy. When the little girl turned two, a miracle happened. Wendy was noticed by an interesting older man. He smelled of quiet strength and great possibilities. Had I finally gotten lucky? She thought with a sinking heart. In her dreams, Wendy saw herself in a snow-white dress and with a huge bouquet of flowers, holding the hand of her respectable husband. She would walk out of the marriage institution and get into an elegant black car. They will go on a wedding trip, and when they return, a splendidly decorated apartment will be waiting for them. Or better yet, not an apartment, but a whole house. Something not heavy and not stingy, but as if floating light, certainly with huge windows, so that there was a lot of air, it will be possible to start living like a human being, to start some unusual hobby, to wear a beautiful dress at home, to wait for her husband from work in the evenings. And then a shrill child's roar broke into her sweet dreams. Here it comes. That clumsy Lisa had fallen again, or hit something, or burned herself. I wonder if it's all kids trying to kill themselves all the time. Or is it just Wendy who's unlucky? Get up. She pulled her crying daughter to her feet. Get up, my misfortune. Let's get dressed. We're going for a walk now. Dressing, by the way, was a separate agony. Lousy girl did not want to stand still and endlessly twirled on the spot. Are you going to stand or not? Wendy shouted, What are you doing to me, you little brat? Stand still and don't move. The girl froze fearfully in place. Her eyes were round and blue, just like her father's, the fool. Wendy thought, just as round, big and dull. The memory made the mood even angrier. And Wendy tugged her daughter roughly by the scruff of the neck. Let's go. No, wait. She tore a piece of paper out of her notebook and scribbled a few words on it. 
She stuffed the piece of paper into a bag, along with a bun, a bottle of water. Now let's go move it, you bastard. She shouted and grabbed the little girl's hand and dragged her behind her. The woods were close by, and it was beautiful. Wendy was glad she wouldn't have to go across town with the baby and spend money on transportation. And she wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible. Girls, I really like the woods. Squatting down. She watched with curiosity as a ladybug, crawling along the blades of grass. Wendy's brain was working feverishly fast. Get it far away. No one will find it, but they'll find the body and then they can get to me. Better leave it here then. Maybe someone will pick it up. I need to rent an apartment in another neighborhood now. Right today. Some place where nobody knows me and I can rent mine. Faster? I just need it fast. Lisa, she called out to her daughter. Stay here and wait. I'll be there soon. And she walked away, pretending to go to the nearest bushes but she moved on to the place where she had left the car. And the farther Wendy walked away from her daughter, the more happiness filled her whole being. Freedom. Could it be that at last she could beg her freedom from fate? Could she really come home right now and throw away all the children's things? Could she really be free? Lisa had no recollection of how she had gotten into the orphanage and that could even be considered a kind of luck. At least she had never known the homesickness that tormented the other kids, all of them taken away from alcoholic parents or early deprived of mom and dad, were homesick. Lisa had comforted them more than once, crying furtively, not opening her heart to anyone, and every time she wiped their tears, hugging them, she thought about how lucky she was after all. Her two-year-old, her caregivers told her, was found all alone in the woods with a bag containing a bun, a scraggly stuffed lion cub, and a note. The girl's name is Lisa. She's healthy, not cranky. Take her away. I can't take care of her. A local forester found the little girl and told later that he found her very close to the edge of the forest. Immediately after he came to the road with a frozen baby in his arms, he immediately heard the sound of a car leaving and even managed to notice that the car was white. But whose car was it? What were the license plates? It all remained a mystery, and in the next few years no one tried to solve it. By nightfall, the man brought the girl to the nearest orphanage, where a kind-hearted nanny gave the little girl warm tea and sandwiches and then bathed her and put her on a free bed. In those days, such sad stories happened in great numbers. The girl's name was changed, as they always did with foundlings to change their fate for the better. And Lisa became Kathy, an orphanage pupil and officially an orphan. Kathy, however, had a good life. The head of the orphanage was of that rare breed of people for whom work was a vocation. The same fanatical attitude to the work she demanded from the whole staff, and that's why only those for whom the happiness and comfort of their little pupils was paramount stayed there. So in the orphanage were affectionate nannies, strict but fair educators, and all together they created an atmosphere close to the family. Later, having already become an adult, Kathy often had to hear that orphanage residents are wild people, socially unadapted, and moreover piously convinced that the whole world owes them by right of orphanhood. It was said that a graduate of an orphanage can be immediately deduced because he has no idea what it is to keep clean or wash dishes. But it wasn't like that in Kathy's childhood. First of all, this orphanage or, as the adults preferred to call it, a children's institution was private. The spouses, who had spent half their lives working in state orphanages, decided in the 90s to open a private orphanage, the first in the region. They had to act at their own risk. Not only that in those years everyone was afraid of racketeers, but there was no support from friends. 
You want to cash in on a child's grief? This is the mildest of what the couple heard from those whom they used to consider friends. And what's more hurtful? Even from relatives. They had to grit their teeth and go forward, supporting each other and learning to grow rhinoceros skin along the way. Otherwise, it was possible to give up all their plans at once, but the racketeers, like their neighbors, friends, and relatives, took to the new project in the state, almost with enthusiasm. It was strictly forbidden to collect tribute from the self-sacrificing founders of the orphanage, but all kinds of support and assistance were encouraged. Of course, in this matter, the racketeering kings pursued their own interests. First of all, charity was a good way to launder money, but the main majority had already managed to realize that soon enough the bandits' freedom would end, and those who were smarter began to transfer assets into legal business, and a businessman who generously donates to charity is traditionally more trustworthy. There was another major difference between the orphanage and the others. Labor education was the norm here. Of course, acquaintances with a fierce envy to the prosperous business immediately arranged it and on the subject of the use of child labor. But all those who came at the request of the commission left with nothing. All safety rules were observed and there were no children exhausted from fatigue. The superintendent, everyone's favorite Vanessa, established reasonable orders, statistics on the children in the orphanages. She told everyone who came to apply for a job could scare anyone. About 10% managed to make it in life. 40% become alcoholics, drug addicts, prison inmates. Why does that happen? Many reasons. But one of them strikes me as particularly important. In most orphanages, technicians clean, cooks cook, cleaners take care of clothes and shoes. Growing up children in adulthood are helpless. They do not know how to clean the house and do not even understand why they need to clean the house, how to cook dinner. In the end, they do not have even basic ideas about how to plan a budget for the month, to lose money in the first two or three days, and then to borrow money from acquaintances until the end of the month is the norm for them. That is why our institution has introduced a system of labor education Children should realize that in adult life, no one will owe them anything. The children learn to keep clean and cook on their own, and older kids earn their first money and learn how to handle it. Someone admired such methods, someone did not accept them, but the headmistress was adamant. We are not raising future dependents, not a contingent for prisons, but full-fledged members of society. Our goal is to release into the big world a person who will work and appreciate the work of others, who will create a family and become a responsible parent. Starting at the age of seven, the children cleaned their rooms every weekend and took turns in the kitchen, helping to wash dishes and cook. Each room was awarded prize points, and at the end of the week, winners could exchange their points for candy, another purchase, or a trip somewhere. High school students were given the opportunity to earn extra money. There was an extensive vegetable garden on the adjoining property. In winter, when there was nothing to do in the vegetable garden, the children were offered to clear snow from the territory or perform some minor repairs under the guidance of a tutor. And although such labor education not always met with great enthusiasm, but still graduates and years later thanked Vanessa for the fact that in the big life they were released, not savages. And Kathy was grateful to both her orphanage and Vanessa for the fact that in her independent life she was not confused. A small, but own apartment, allocated by the state, and work almost immediately found. At first Kathy worked as a molder in a dumpling shop, then for some time stood behind the cash register in a supermarket, and a little later, she got a job in a veterinary clinic. There the work was quieter. All she had to do was to make appointments for clients and take payment. So she worked for a year, resting from the hustle and bustle, 
and the need to rotate on all turns. She loved it at the clinic. She even had the idea of studying to be a veterinarian. And perhaps everything was very feasible if it were not for one small but very significant but. Robert showed up at the clinic like the sun, a blonde-haired, two-meter-tall, Viking-like hero with a red kitty who turned out to be unbelievably small in his huge hands. I beat the dogs off the street. He said worriedly, Look, is it safe? Poor little thing was frightened. His voice was enveloping and thick, like warm honey. Kathy couldn't resist and reached out to pet the cat. It was hardly in need of help. It was dozing peacefully, nestled on the chest of its savior. When the girl's hand touched it, the kitty lazily opened its golden eyes. I'll get the doctor now, said the girl. You wait a minute. Only one of the four doctors was free, and Kathy was very glad that the only one available was a man. The ladies would have flirted with the handsome visitor, and then, which in fact, then Kathy did not have time to think. The Viking had already left the office, and his red-haired pet had gone back to sleep. Is everything all right? Kathy smiled. Thank goodness. How much do we owe for the appointment? Kathy quickly entered all the owner's information into the computer and printed out the pet exam report. While he was paying, the girl was thinking about what else she could talk to this touching giant about. Robert? She asked. Will you keep the kitty? He blew affectionately on the cat's ear. Where will she go now? I'll bring her back in two weeks for vaccinations. I should think of a name for her. Maybe you can give me a hint? She's so golden-eyed, red as honey. Kathy smiled. She probably needs a sweet name, honey, and bent a beautiful eyebrow at the Viking and immediately laughed at his own joke. No, it's too long. Halva. Right. Let's go with Halva. It's so sweet. What's up? Let's go home, Halva. Goodbye. He squinted and read the name tag. Kathy, see you in two weeks. Exactly 14 days later, Robert stepped through the door of the veterinary clinic, which was open due to the summer heat. In his arms was a red-haired and golden, calmed and rounded Halva. Good afternoon. He smiled dazzlingly. Kathy's heart throbbed. In two weeks, the impression Robert had made on her had faded. Why am I so excited? She asked herself. So what if he was a good-looking guy? Aren't there enough of them? And yet she waited for this day. She saved some money and went to a beauty salon to get a manicure, and then the hairdressers persuaded her to get a melamine, and it turned out that it was not in vain. Now the girl's hair seemed almost twice as voluminous and shimmered beautifully in the sun. Kathy even began to color, going to work, although previously considered it unnecessary. And she began to wear her few pieces of jewelry, a simple silver ring and earrings with small transparent stones. The earrings had been given to her by the head of the orphanage herself for her excellent studies. The ring was a gift from a sponsor for March 8th. Now Kathy felt almost beautiful when she met Viking Robert. Here comes Halva for her vaccination, she said and went over to pet the kitty. How are you doing? Has the kitty already settled in the house? In fact, she could have waited for Robert to come closer to the reception desk. But Kathy wanted to show off her slim figure, which the uniform could not hide. Robert glanced at the girl with an appraising gaze. She's settled in, and that's very nice, because it's boring to live alone, and there's a cat waiting at home. Kathy, I could hear some hidden hint in those words. You don't say, she sighed. I live alone too, and sometimes I get bored. And you? Robert winked. Come and visit. When you get bored, call me. You have my contacts, right? This is awkward. The girl was embarrassed. What's awkward about it? 
The Viking was nobly indignant. Kung Halva and I will be waiting for you. That same evening, Kathy met up with her best friend to discuss the news. Nancy she had met long ago back at the orphanage. Nancy was 10 years old when she was taken away from her father, a bitter drunk. On her first night in the orphanage, the girl tucked her nose into the corner of her pillow and blissfully said, How nice it is here. Kathy sat up on the bed from surprise. You're so good. Shocked, she exhaled. Other people cry for weeks and weeks, and you say it's good. What's bad about it? Nancy was surprised. The bed's clean, the food's good, nobody drinks. It's good. And the next day she told Kathy all about it and how she had begged on the street to buy a bottle for her father because otherwise he beat her. And about how one day her father disappeared somewhere and the girl didn't eat anything for three whole days. And only when she fainted at school, they took her to the hospital and from there they brought her to the orphanage. They said daddy went to get treatment for alcoholism. She snorted. They say that when my dad gets well, he'll get a job and take me home. They lie like I'm a little girl. He's cured, of course. Well, Kathy suggested thoughtfully, maybe he really wants to be cured. We had a girl, but her mother gave up drinking and took her back. Now they come to visit every Saturday and bring candy. That's not my daddy. Nancy said sadly, he'll never give up his booze. But that's where she was wrong. Nancy's father was indeed treated in a narcological dispensary and forever forbade himself even to think about drinking. Moreover, he got a job and visited his daughter every night. After six months, he was able to take her away for good. Nancy's father turned out to be a talented carpenter and often came to the shelter with his daughter, each time with some new gift new chairs for the babies, long benches for the dining room, and once he made ten closets for the children's rooms and didn't charge a penny for his work. Though Vanessa insisted on paying for it, you took care of my daughter, he said, while I, like a dog, the last. Tears of remorse and shame welled up in his eyes. He never stopped blaming himself for the past. When Nancy turned 18, her father was gone. Some hooligans attacked him as he was walking after work in the evening and beat him badly. The man died on the spot from the beating. Nancy got her father's apartment, but she had no job, and Vanessa came to the rescue again. She helped Nancy to pass the secretarial courses and took a job with her. But she didn't work for long. The pay is low. There are no prospects, she said, and secretaries are required many places. I'll get a job in some firm so that the boss is a man. You know what I mean? I want to live like a man, not work for an idea. Only much later Kathy could guess from the fragmentary stories of her friend that her father, driven by an eternal sense of guilt for his former drunkenness, had spoiled his daughter too much. That's where Nancy got that unpleasant arrogance and ironclad confidence that she deserved the best and preferably for free. She managed to get her dream job after all. The ideal lasted for three months, and at the beginning of the fourth month, the boss's wife flew into their office like a furious fury. The boss was just enjoying his morning coffee, and the pretty secretary was sitting on his lap. Nancy was out of work that morning, and missing a few other little things. A few strands of hair and three broken fingernails. For a month Nancy sat unemployed, nursing her bruises and complaining to Kathy about the injustice of her fate. A job offer from a friend at a veterinary clinic she turned down, but she was lucky again. Her next employer turned out to be a widower, and now it was possible not to fear jealous wives. Since then, the girl managed to make repairs in the apartment and even have their own, although not expensive, car. With Kathy, however, they were friends almost as before. That is, 
Kathy pretended not to notice the increasing arrogance of her friend. I don't know what to do, Nancy. She confessed that evening. There's this man I met, and I... Didn't you notice if he was coming in his own car or what? Nancy interrupted her. How's he dressed? Is he wearing brand name clothes or market clothes? Clothes like clothes. Kathy frowned. I don't know your brands, and I don't know what he's driving. Nancy sighed brokenly. When will you learn to pay attention to such things? It's very important. A handsome face is one thing, but maybe he doesn't have any other virtues besides a pretty face. So what then? What's that got to do with it? So now we have to evaluate every man we meet and see if he's rich or poor? Is it better to waste time with a pauper? Live on a dime and admire his pretty face until he gets sick. All right, well, you gotta take a chance anyway. Stop by his place if he wants you to. See where he... It had been three months. No, 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 Kathy. This was not the deal. Robert smiled crookedly at the sight of the certificate from the antenatal clinic. You should have thought about avoiding pregnancy. He looked terribly confident. He looked at his friend as condescendingly as a wise adult looks at a misbehaving child. You can't fool me, but I'm not angry with you. That's what was clear in his gaze. And that condescension was so disgusting that Kathy lowered her head so as not to see it. So that was it. Turns out pregnancy was something to be avoided. Why hadn't they agreed on that right away? Wasn't there anything you should have thought of? Asked the girl. Two people have children. I am a man. He answered simply. After all, it is not me to go nine months pregnant, to give birth and a child alone to raise. Two, not me. From me only alimony and even then not much. So pregnancy and everything that is connected with it, it is a woman's care. From this simple reasoning on the soul of Kathy became even more disgusting. It can be like that. It seems that a person argues logically, consistently, and you listen and realize that he is just a coward. I thought we were in love, she said sadly. You said yourself that you love me, didn't you? Don't you remember? I do, but I didn't say I wanted to have children. Robert pointed out, why put it all in one place? And to tell the truth, he wasn't lying. There was no talk of children, but Kathy thought that one thing implied another. The holy woman Vanessa and the whole wonderful orphanage staff taught their pupils to take care of themselves and others, not to wait for help from the state to earn their own money, but how to teach them to beware of people's irresponsibility, thoughtlessness, common dishonesty? Kathy, noticing her friend's distress, Robert began, let's talk frankly. We have not been together long enough and it is too early to talk about true love, at most about falling in love, attraction, and passion. Wouldn't you agree that's true? Maybe it is. Kathy didn't disagree. It's probably true. But don't you realize that the situation has changed? Our with you love, do not love, it is now a matter of tenth. There is a child, it is already there, and you and I, as parents, need to think about its future, not about our own hobbies. We can agree on that. This baby, Kathy, is not good for you or me right now. Get rid of it, and you and I can continue to date, get to know each other, and who knows, maybe someday. I've been gotten rid of too. The girl interrupted him. My father and mother didn't need me either, so they took me to the forest. But that's quite an atrocity. Robert was horrified, but I don't want it to come to that. Look, what's five weeks? It's just a clot of cells. But if left unchecked, it could ruin both our lives. You want us to make a deal? I'm making a deal, and you don't like it. It's not a deal. Kathy flared up. 
doesn't that mean finding a solution that works for everyone? Do you want to be happy? Is that what you think of me? It's not for you. It's for me to get an abortion. And you want to buy that we'll keep seeing each other. And maybe get married someday. Do you think I want to be in a relationship with a traitor? I'm not a traitor. I'm being honest about what I want. And if you decide to have the baby, you know I won't. I won't. I won't want to continue the relationship. I'm not planning on rushing into this. You'll file for child support, of course, and I'll have to pay for something I didn't want and don't want. Imagine going to the store, looking at something, and they won't let you out until you pay. How is that fair? You don't even have any money on you. You just came in to wait out the rain. But no, they make you pay. It's not fair, finally. What if you went to the store, took a bite of cake, they make you pay for it? Is that fair? Don't twist things around, Kathy. Besides, have you thought about yourself? Okay, me. My well-being is not part of your calculations. I get that. What about you? You can't get a big alimony check. You wanted to study, but if you decide to keep the baby, what's the point of studying? Think about it. I'm asking you to think about it. I've already thought about everything. The girl said firmly and looked at Robert right into his handsome face. There was no love left. Washed it away with a wave of cold Robert cynicism, all his supposedly reasonable reasoning, but in fact just designed to mask the fear that now his cozy, quiet life will change. What did I see in you? She asked quietly. You look like a big, strong man, but inside you're a little boy who's afraid of everything. You're afraid of everything, Robert. You only had enough to pick up a stray cat, and you don't want to know your own child. Calm down, you fool. Don't cry. We don't need your alimony. She left without even slamming the door behind her. Robert rubbed his forehead and smiled. A stone had fallen from his soul. He was truly grateful to Kathy for her pride, the kind that if she said she didn't need alimony, she wouldn't ask for it. Oh, and he'd already started thinking of ways to get a smaller amount out of his income. He'd have to negotiate at work to draw him a certificate of his miserable salary, and that would be so tedious. He'd made a mistake with Kathy, of course. He thought that since she worked in a famous clinic, she probably had a good salary and a nice apartment, but the main bummer was that when he was making inquiries about the clinic, he found pictures of its owner Wendy on the internet. And when he saw Kathy, he nearly collapsed on the floor. The young receptionist looked uncannily like Wendy. Robert was sure that Kathy was the daughter of the clinic owner. Probably the mother had decided to let her favorite daughter work under supervision. Why, if the work is not dusty, and on a salary, who would hurt his child? And in the long run, the girl, the owner of the clinic. No, it's definitely a good fit. Who knew she was a former foster kid? And her salary is meager, and her apartment is a studio apartment that hasn't been renovated in 100 years. Though Kathy tries somehow to improve her poor dwelling, to plaster here and there, to paste tiles here, as they say, poor but clean. I put up new wallpaper, but you can't hide poverty. It climbs out of every crevice, annoying, insolent, but that's for those who know how to look. In short, it's good that Kathy got rid of her without too much trouble. He doesn't need a pregnant orphan. And Kathy wanted to talk to someone to try to find a way out of all this hopelessness. Nancy, on learning of her friend's pregnancy, was almost hysterical. How can you be so naive? She screamed. They all sing songs about love as long as they want their own. As soon as they get their tails pinched, they say, No, 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 no. I don't owe you anything. I didn't promise you anything. And your eyes are as flat as a plonk, like carrots. Kathy grinned or like a cat's, big and round, round. Oh, Kathy, 
My friend shook her head sadly. You should have consulted me. Men, what are they like? Well, like stray dogs. They should be accustomed to themselves slowly, gradually, without pressure, and you immediately boom, a shoe on the head. All right, let's think about how to cope and how I'll give birth. Raise them. Give birth? In syllables, interrogated Nancy. You, Kathy, do you realize what you're saying? What are you talking about? All right, don't dust. I know a good clinic. It's confidential safe. I'll take you there. I'm going into labor. The girl repeated stubbornly. I've already decided. It's not too late to change your mind before it's too late. But you understand. It's, I don't even know, a kitten. And then you think 100 times. And this is a whole baby. Is that why you don't have cats? Kathy smiled. Our Kathy. She was stopped at the front door by the owner of the clinic. I need to talk to you. Come in right now. It's urgent. Actually, the owner's appearance at the clinic was an unusual event in itself. Wendy rarely came here, preferring to conduct her business from home. Thank goodness modern communications allowed for that. Plus, she often left the receptionist in her place and went to warm countries with her daughter. Our winters are too long, she'd say. We need a break from it somehow. In the owner's absence, her ex-husband, Benjamin, was in charge. It was said that he had once been a rich man, and it was in those carefree times that he had married the beautiful Wendy, who was a couple of decades younger than he was. He was flattered that his young wife, only 20 years old against his 40, was the winner of the City Beauty Contest. He had organized her winning the contest himself as a wedding present. To keep Wendy busy, he bought a dyeing business from a friend on the cheap and gave it to his wife. Wendy, on the other hand, started reluctantly, but then suddenly got involved. She really wanted her veterinary clinic to become the best in town, and she achieved this by using her husband's money and listening to his advice. But then dark times came for Benjamin. His own business, his business went under, taking his half-brother as his manager. Benjamin, after a few months, found he'd been ripped off. Wendy, with a newborn daughter, was instantly taken over by his brother. The bankrupt businessman decided that enough of his dangerous games and went to work in an ordinary carpentry shop. He had less money, but his son became healthy. Wendy did not long enjoy marital happiness with her second husband. The money was wasted, and the careless owner went to jail for burglary. Confused and unhappy Wendy tried to return to Benjamin, but he refused to accept her. But he did not refuse to help her if she needed to look after the affairs of the veterinary clinic. Why would he do that? Out of Christian charity, out of pity for his hapless ex, or out of concern for his daughter, no one knew. But today Wendy, personally present at the clinic, and moreover, talked to the usual receptionist. It was doubly unusual. Up to this point, she had only gone as far as talking to the doctors. In the office, there was already a tea table set with sweets. Help yourself, invited the proprietress. Thank you, Wendy. I just had breakfast. Did you say it was urgent? Yes, indeed I did. She smiled so insincerely that Kathy didn't immediately realize she wasn't going to hear anything good. You grew up in an orphanage, didn't you? Wendy asked, in an orphanage. I always seem to, said the warden thoughtfully. That orphanage kids are so unstable, and I see you know what's what in this life. Our orphanage was special. Kathy smiled. We were taught to cook, to clean, and even to earn money. Vanessa, this is our supervisor. Vanessa? Wendy asked. I know, I know. We were in the same school, even in the same class. She was always so helpful, kind. I remember all the stray dogs knew her because she fed them. 
True, after school we did not communicate with her, but I heard about the shelter. Sometimes I wish I'd given her my queen. Who? Yes, my daughter Emily. The woman sighed, you know, in a trusting tone of voice, she said. She's already 17, and she still can't cut her own bread. She seems to know where the money comes from, but how it's earned, she wrote today. Mom, I'm going shopping with my girlfriends today. Put 10 to 15,000 on my card. This money is like a dime to her. What kind of world does she live in? The real world or some fairy tale about the golden antelope? Wendy stopped talking and angrily blew a strand of hair out of her face. So I decided to follow your Vanessa's example. I'm going to teach her to work. Do you think that's a good idea? Kathy looked at her boss in confusion. Why would she want to consult with a receptionist? Labor education is good for everyone. So it's a great idea. I think so too. Wendy was delighted. I've decided to take the fool to work. Let her start her working career under my supervision. She can start by sitting at the front desk. You teach her everything okay. And once she's learned everything, I'll hire her full time. And by then, you'll have enough time to find something else to do. Stop. Unexpectedly, I interrupted my boss, Kathy. Do you want me to leave? Well, yes. Wendy shrugged. My Emily has to work somewhere to keep you too. What's the point? I want Emily to learn to earn her own allowance. And if she works part-time, what will she earn, tears? So we have a deal, Kathy. Will you teach Emily? Well, how could I not? The girl smiled. Of course I will, and I'll teach her, and I'll quit, so that only your idle girl will do something. Don't get your hopes up, Wendy. I won't do it. Don't be rude to me. You're still working for me, don't forget. Not anymore. That's for me to decide, not you. How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you talk to people like that? You have to work two more weeks. The boss yelled at me. And where did all her charm and allure go? Smooth and well-groomed face, created for smiles and successful photos, suddenly became somehow frozen, like a mask. And only her lips curved ugly, and her eyes burned with the wild anger of a landlady, whom she had suddenly disobeyed, a sir. You are bound by the law. Do you even know that there is such a thing as labor law? Kathy suddenly realized why Wendy's face looked so frightening. She couldn't even frown because of the Botox injections. And that lack of facial expression, combined with the angry look and the shrill voice, was the scariest thing of all. The labor code. You ever heard of it? Have you heard anything about hiring and firing procedures? Have you ever signed an employment contract with me? No. I work unofficially so you, Wendy, can pay less tax. So don't scare me. It's pointless. I don't owe you anything. And I'm leaving immediately. Good luck adjusting your Emily to the real world. I have connections. Wendy hissed back at her. It's not hard to make a contract and forge your signature. Go ahead. Kathy agreed almost cheerfully and I have the number of the tax office. I can tell a lot of interesting things. But despite the apparent victory from the clinic, Kathy went out almost in despair. Was the whole world conspiring against her? Everyone had turned their backs, everyone. Her lover, her friend, and now no job. Where was she supposed to go now? Jesus Christ, what to do now? Go home. I told Kathy to go home. What do we do? We'll figure that out later. Right now, go home, make some tea and think about it. But home was only slightly easier. It was uncomfortable to sit alone in four walls. I wanted to talk to someone, not to complain, but just to be near someone alive, a human voice to hear. The girl suddenly wanted to visit her shelter. Probably. 
just as an adult in a difficult situation. And for the first time in all this time, Kathy suddenly felt her heavy, painful tension let go, the fear of the future. She can handle it. The world is not without good people. And the proof of that was sitting across from her. Thank you, Vanessa, she smiled. And suddenly she felt bitter tears flowing down her cheeks. Don't cry, the woman said sternly and immediately stroked the head of her pupil. That's what we are people to help each other and otherwise how to live. I'm just a little ashamed. Kathy confessed. I just came to stay here to remember my childhood, but it was like asking for help. Vanessa nodded and smiled. And you're ashamed of that. Remember something, girl, something I read somewhere, and it's always stuck in my memory. Asking for help doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're not alone in the world. That's it, Kathy. That's it. And here's the other thing. By the time our baby's born, it'll be five years since you got your apartment. Here's what we could do. You could move in with us, live in a shelter, and rent out your apartment. You'll get an allowance, and you'll work, so you'll make a reasonable amount of money. And then you'll study, and you won't need to be wise. You'll earn a normal income. Kathy smiled through her tears, nodded and thanked. Vanessa was the only person who supported her in such a difficult moment. It would seem so, but who am I to her? How many Kathys does she have? Well, that's the kind of person Vanessa is. She wouldn't leave you in the lurch. I got her to scrub floors too, Vanessa. I talked to a sponsor. He needs a cleaner in his office. Evening hours, would you do it? It's not paying one million, but a little extra money wouldn't hurt. Right, you'll have a salary. The office is small. You can do everything in 40 minutes. You'll come after the end of the working day. That is at seven. What do you say? Thank you, I say Vanessa, replied Kathy. I'm all for it. How far is the office? Just a stone's throw away. And by the way, you can start today. Payment is once a week on your card on Mondays. Kathy was almost happy. Now she wasn't so scared of the future. At the shelter, she worked as a cook two days and two days out with another girl. And now another part-time job that wasn't hard. Of course, it's infinitely far from her dream job, she repeated to herself. But in our position, there's no point in getting cocky. We have some money and that's fine. And then the baby would be born and there would be more and allowances and money from renting an apartment. And maybe we could even study. She wanted badly to share her joy with someone. But at least with Nancy, though she wouldn't appreciate it. But Nancy was away at some resort with her chief lover and was unavailable for communication. After a couple of months, the friends did get to see each other. But Kathy quickly realized that sharing good news with Nancy was a really bad idea. Scrubbing floors is for beggars. Nancy snorted. I'm sorry, Kathy, but if you're down to it, you know it's just a dump. You're all ready. She glanced disapprovingly at her friend's washed out t-shirt and skirt, which had obviously been chosen only for its elasticized waistband, but had no other merit. You're already one step away from the bottom. She finished confidently. For example, look at what you're wearing. It's a disgrace, not clothes. Do not sew normal clothes for pregnant women. I'm dressed like this because I'm coming from work and my job is mopping floors. It's stupid to show up in a dressy outfit and mop. Well, let's say, Nancy agreed, but what you're wearing is old and faded and your hair is all gone. She lifted a strand of her friend's hair with two fingers. Kathy immediately pulled back. She'd never liked that kind of unceremonious touching. You've got all the roots growing out. It's so unkempt. You look like a beggar. And I am a beggar now. Kathy wasn't offended at all. If I was kicked out of my job, it means you didn't work hard enough. 
You should have worked harder. No, it means that my boss's daughter has to start somewhere. So now she works as a receptionist in a clinic. And I can write my own letter of resignation and be on my way. But I left without a letter of resignation. No one officially hired me, so there's no one to fire. Isn't there any registrars needed anywhere else? Like this? And Kathy pointed to her eloquently rounded belly. You wouldn't believe it, they don't. Who needs an employee who's about to go on maternity leave? And to us washerwomen, somehow easier to treat. No registration, no maternity pay. You come in, you clean up, you get paid. Money. Nancy gave me a scornful look. You call that money? You don't need much. I wouldn't lift a finger for that little thing. I have no choice. Kathy answered calmly. When you don't have any money at all, you'll be glad to have something to put on your plate. Kathy bit her lip and was silent for a long time. She saw that her friend didn't understand her at all and judged her, which was much worse, and even became ashamed of her undemanding nature. Kathy had long ago realized that for some reason many people considered the struggle for survival an unworthy cause and would rather sit and cry than take up what was on offer. After all, Nancy had an intermediate moment in her life when she had not yet met her Kevin, and she was forced out of her job due to downsizing. So she suggested to Nancy that she talk to her boss about employment. Their veterinary clinic was in need of a second person at the front desk. Nancy smiled slyly and wondered, how much will I be paid? When she heard the salary, she grinned, it won't be enough for me, you little thing. And the schedule is two after two. It is not to see the light of day, but even a little money is better than nothing. Objected Kathy, somewhat hurt by the neglect of her friend. I will not work for such wages. Slowly emphasizing the intonation of the words, repeated Nancy. Did I say something I didn't understand? Even then, Kathy thought that their intimate friendship seemed to be coming to an end. Nancy, willingly or unwillingly, had just humiliated her. She had made it clear that Kathy was content with a pittance that she, Nancy, would not look at, even though she herself was now sitting without any money at all. Her words left an unpleasant residue, especially since it was clear that if Nancy had said it without thinking, she would have apologized. So she had just said what she wanted to say. And now she has re-emphasized that Kathy is happy with petty cash. I don't get it. Why are you so eager to humiliate me? She asked bluntly. Is this how you elevate yourself in your own eyes? You wouldn't work for a small salary. Fine, but it's your decision. You sit around and wait for a bigger one to be offered but I choose to go and earn something so I don't starve to death waiting for better times. I, I'm not humiliating you. Nancy was confused. I'm just saying that, well, I wouldn't work there. And I'm not allowed to express my opinion. I'd have got over it if you hadn't. Kathy replied bitterly, and I'd have been much happier if you'd been supportive. She returned home that evening with a heavy heart. That was all. No, she has more of a friend, Nancy, because, yeah, is that how real friends act? I mean, what's the big deal? That friendship is long gone, and Kathy knew it all along, but she only realized it today. And when she did, she suddenly felt a tremendous sense of relief, as if a heavy weight had been lifted. Kathy was lucky. The pregnancy was easy. No toxicosis, no distractions, no swelling. Even on the contrary, the future mother felt a surge of strength and energy, which allowed her to work almost without fatigue and even carve out time to prepare for exams. She still had hopes of studying to be a veterinarian. Vanessa encouraged and supported her in every possible way. Good for you for not giving up. Now you have a child to raise, and the profession, and such a demanded, 
you will be useful in any case. After all, animals like people will always need medical help. Even if in the city all stop having pets, you just get together and go to the village to work. Cows and goats also need doctors. So prepare properly and remember, you are doing this not only for yourself, but also for your baby. You're like my mom. Kathy said affectionately, and Vanessa smiled at her. How could it be any other way? You're my mom, all of you. All of you who have been brought up here are like children. You raise everyone, you lead everyone. It's probably hard to understand, even if you don't encounter it. I think I do, said Kathy. After all, we, but many of us at least, and parents have never known their parents. We only had an orphanage, a tutor and you. And if someone looks at you as a mother, you become one. The headmistress didn't answer her anything, only stroked her head habitually. But Kathy had no time to notice the tears glistening in the woman's eyes. In the evening, she still ran around scrubbing the office floor. And although Kathy had never seen the owner, she received money on her card every Monday, and often with a larger amount, and such transfers were accompanied by a short note. Bonus. In general, cleaning this office was not a difficult job. It was only necessary to wipe the dust and wash the floors. Nothing in the chief's office needed to be cleaned. That's just the way he is. Vanessa explained, he doesn't like his things to be touched. He cleans his own. Well, that's the kind of thing a man has. Well, that's fine with him. It's less work for you. By the way, I told him you'd be out of work in a couple months, but he, what's his name by the way? Kathy asked. I haven't seen him. I don't even know his name. His name is James. The superintendent replied. Well, he told me that he would wait for you for three months after the birth. If you want to keep working, you can come back. Did you ask him to do that? Kathy smiled. No way. The woman resented him. It's just that he's very happy with your work, so he's willing to support you. Do you think it's so easy to find a good employee? Oh, Kathy, there's always a shortage. Kathy decided to take this explanation for granted and didn't ask any more questions. And yes, Vanessa suddenly remembered. I almost forgot. He was away on business yesterday and will be back tomorrow. He asked me to clean his office during these two days, but for God's sake, don't move anything in there. I don't care if the whole desk is full of papers and chairs are lying around. Anyway, your job is to wipe the dust and mop the floors and nothing else. It was even scary to enter the chief's office. In case he accidentally touches some trifle, and then you'll get a harsh reprimand from the boss. But once I was in the Holy of Holies, I realized that there was nothing to worry about. The place was so perfectly tidy that I probably didn't need to clean it. But since you asked, Kathy pulled a dust rag from the pocket of her lab coat. James, it had to be said, was clearly the kind of person who liked to go over everything. For example, when hiring a new cleaner, he always asked about her clothing size so that he could buy the appropriate work coat and all the rags, cleaning gloves, detergents, brooms. All of this he kept on top of, and in time to purchase what was needed. Kathy decided to start with the desk. It was almost completely empty, a pen, a day planner, and a framed picture of a little girl, probably a daughter or maybe a granddaughter. Kathy quickly wiped the desk and was about to dust off the portrait. Only leaning closer to the photo did she suddenly freeze. She knew the little girl in the picture, and she couldn't help but know it, for a photograph of the little girl, seemingly at the same age, was kept in Kathy's own file. And underneath the photo was the caption, Kathy. In the picture, in both of those pictures, was her, Vanessa. Before Kathy knew it, she had grabbed her cell phone out of her pocket 
and dialed the number of the orphanage manager. Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes, Kathy. As always, the woman answered calmly, What's wrong? You told me to clean the chief's office. Yeah, did you break anything? No, said Kathy, but he has a picture of me as a kid on his desk. There was a confused silence. Kathy? Vanessa finally spoke up. And you in one word, are you sure you're not imagining it? Could it be a similar girl? You said this man is a sponsor of our orphanage. Kathy interrupted her. Has he ever been to the orphanage himself? Could he have seen me there? The superintendent thought for a moment. No, I don't remember that. He always sent couriers, but he never visited the orphanage. I wanted to invite him to the Christmas party once, but he replied strangely that it was hard for him to see the children. I thought he must have had some terrible tragedy in his life. Kathy, why are we guessing at the end of the day? Let me call him right now and find out. Kathy looked at the pictures of herself as a child again, and forgetting that the superintendent couldn't see her, shook her head. No, I guess I shouldn't. I mean, just don't. He'll be back tomorrow. I'll come to work early and talk to him. Okay, Vanessa agreed. Here's the thing, Kathy. I'll just go with you. Just to be on the safe side, Jane sat at the desk and looked at the picture of Kathy in the file or at the framed photo. Vanessa and Kathy sat silently across from him. Finally, he sighed and covered his face with his hands. This is impossible. He said in a strangled voice, it's completely impossible. Kathy, oh my God, how could it be? Didn't Wendy say you drowned? Wendy, Vanessa asked, who's that? My daughter's mother. The man said angrily, if you can even call that bastard a mother. We were dating, even though I knew I didn't mean it. Wendy wanted a richer man and I was just a lowlife. Anyway, she quickly realized that I wasn't worth much and things were coming to an end. I was initially very attracted to her and then I realized that no, the girl to other people's money greedy. I gave her a white car, as I remember now, and it was a medium-sized car. And when Wendy saw it, she curled her lips and then she said, why didn't you give me your money? Oh, Unite? That's when it all became clear to me. I wasn't worried that such a beautiful girl would leave me. But then she comes running one day and immediately screams that she's pregnant, the terms are missed, and the child is mine. Yeah, James shrugged. I didn't believe her, honestly. I thought she just wanted it. I don't know. Trying to get me to spend money again, Anyway, I sent her away. I thought I'd forget about it and forgot about it for a while. Didn't think about it for two years. I was in the sect republic on business. That's how the business for two years and dragged me down and, but never mind. And then I felt that no, I can't do that. My heart's not in the right place. I called her and there were strangers on the phone. I went to her house and found out something. Allegedly, she gave birth to a baby girl, but then she rented out her apartment and lived in another neighborhood, in a rich neighborhood. And she had a man who seemed to be so respectable, but it's not hard to find out about the man. I still had some connections in town. The guy was really well paid and older than Wendy, a lot older. What do I care? I wanted to see my daughter. Once I caught up with my beautiful ex, I wanted to talk to her, and she tells me that my daughter went to the village to her grandmother and drowned in the river. She says, and she herself is crying. Then she took this picture out of her purse and gave it to me. Kathy was found in the woods. The shelter manager said with a sigh, a forest ranger found her. The girl was all alone. She had a note with her saying her name was Lisa, that she was healthy and that she couldn't be cared for. Wendy, 
Gritting his teeth, James. Snake, she's not a woman, she's a witch. Wendy? Kathy suddenly asked, So her name is Wendy? Well, yeah. She sort of divorced her husband afterwards, and then I don't know what afterwards. She has a veterinary clinic. Right. He slammed his open palm on the table. Let's go to her. Let's all go. Let's all go, James. Vanessa tried to stop him. Maybe you shouldn't get so hot. Chill out. Vanessa. He turned toward her, and the woman stepped back. There was so much suffering in his gaze. For so many years, I thought my daughter, that she had drowned. And she'd been living in an orphanage all this time? She didn't know her father or her mother. I couldn't bear to look at the children, my heart sank. If it hadn't been for chance, she and I would never have found each other. And you're telling me to chill out. Kathy, he took his daughter by the hand. Daughter, you can't be nervous. You'd better stay at home. I'll deal with your mom myself, and then I'll come and tell you everything. And you and Vanessa, that's right. Vanessa cheered up. This is your business and me and Kathy. Unnecessary nerves do not need. We'll stay together, have tea and cakes. Yes, James, Dad. Kathy looked pleadingly at her father. Maybe you shouldn't go either. Maybe it's over. The important thing is that everything's okay now. You'll be a grandfather soon. What's the point? The man hugged his daughter and kissed her affectionately on the top of her head. I'll be back very soon, Kathy, he promised. Wendy, meanwhile, was almost perfectly happy. She felt 20 years younger, and that happened to her every time she got a new lover. This time it was a totally awesome character, a pure Viking. If only I'd known my clinic had such handsome clients. She murmured, standing on tiptoe to reach the guy's lips. You'd show up for work more often. So what's your kitty's name, Helva? Robert smiled and touched Wendy's lips with his fingertips. Yes, she's got a sweet tooth. I wonder how old she is. You can't tell from her face, but she must be putting more money into herself than he could ever dream of. Halva is my favorite treat. By the way, how about we take a trip to the birthplace of Oriental Sweets together? Oh, come on. Where would I get that kind of money? Sha, sure, honey. I'll pay for it myself, and you don't need to talk about it. Suddenly she stammered and looked fearfully at the door. Some voices were coming from behind it. You can't go to Wendy's. I'm allowed. A man's voice bellowed back. At the same second, the door swung open with a bang. James looked disdainfully at the tall guy Wendy was clinging to. Get out of here. He tossed it carelessly. You can wait outside because I have an important conversation with Wendy. Robert looked at Wendy confusedly and noticing her slight nod, left the office. What do you want, James? The woman asked. She looked perfectly calm. Is that allowed? You barge into my office, distract me from something important. What's all the fuss about? You told me. He started, looking her straight in the eye. You told me our daughter was dead. That she drowned, she was. Wendy agreed, and you came just to remind me of that misfortune. That there was no need to try. I've never forgotten the fact that, ah, that you, a witch, left a two-year-old girl alone in the woods, and you didn't care if she died or lived. That she was found by a forest ranger is unheard of. You filthy, disgusting monster. You could never forget that. Tell me, why did you do it? Why didn't you put her in an orphanage when she was such a nuisance to you? Why did you leave her to her fate? Wendy still remained impenetrable. She pulled out a long, thin cigarette and took her time smoking it. Because, she answered calmly, that then, there would have been some tails left, and I had to be clean before my fiancé. I have no idea what he would do if he found out I had a child. 
Maybe he would have chased me away, maybe not, but I couldn't take any chances. If I hadn't gotten married, where would I be now? I'd be living in some rundown house with leaky faucets. No money and no hope. Was I supposed to choose poverty? That's why I sent my child to her death, but she survived. Indifferently, Wendy shrugged, and I never loved her anyway. She was ruining my life. What did I see with her but squeals and snot? I should have left her at the hospital right away, but for some reason I didn't realize it at the time and then I regretted it every minute. And when I had a chance to make my life better, I had to turn it down. I wonder how many years you'll spend in prison where you'll no doubt belong. How much will they give you if your dirty black secret gets out? Just think about it. A little girl, defenseless, alone in a dark forest, abandoned there by her own mother. What kind of punishment do you think a woman like that deserves? And what are the headlines everywhere? The owner of a thriving veterinary clinic tried to kill her own child in cold blood. Who would show up here after that? Who would trust a clinic run by a baby killer with their hamster? Get out of town, Wendy. Close that lousy office, take your mail and go far away, and don't come back here. You come into this town and you know what's waiting for you. And without another word, he turned abruptly and left the office. Robert immediately appeared in the doorway. Well, what interesting news. I just found out. He said, looking meaningfully at the woman, and I wonder what I'll do with them. Several months passed. Wendy sat on the sand and looked at the sea waves. Now all she had to do was sit there and watch. Robert, her sweet Viking, had turned out to be a notorious extortionist. He overheard a conversation under the door and then started demanding money for his silence. The sums got bigger and bigger, and then the moment came when there was nothing left to pay. Robert, quite contented and rich, immediately left in an unknown direction, and Wendy was left in her only dress and penniless. Now she came to the beach every day and just sat on the shore waiting for darkness. People left, but after them in the trash cans, there was a mountain of leftovers. When Wendy first dared to stick her hand in the pile of garbage, a well-fed rat jumped out of the container with a wild squeal. Wendy bounced away, but the rat rushed past. Going near the trash was scary. What if there were more of the less timid, rat-like kin sitting there. But I was hungry, unbearably hungry. And then Wendy noticed that at the top of the trash heap, there was a piece of bread tortilla that had not been eaten. Armed with a twig, she picked it up and pulled it to the ground. That night, Wendy fell asleep feeling satiated. And that feeling of satisfied hunger was so wonderful that she was no longer intimidated by the trash rats. Being able to get some food was far more important. But cold weather was ahead, and the woman knew that with the closing of the beach season, she would have to beg for a night shelter. There was still a way to get in. They said they didn't take everyone, favoring proven tenants who were absolutely certain not to cause trouble. Wendy filled her palms with seawater and tried to wash her face and iron her hair. She had to make a good impression on the administration of the lodge. It wouldn't be easy, of course, but she would try hard. The homeless shelter was in a good location. It was in an industrial zone, so gassy that it seemed as if you were not inhaling the air here, but eating it, swallowing piece after piece with difficulty. But, of course, in general, all these night shelters, they are in the Department of Social Services and social services in all countries of the world hate to spend money. They're so pro-waste. Wendy, looking around, walked quickly toward the long line of sloppily dressed people apparently being admitted to the night shelter there. She quietly stood at the tail of the line and tried to listen to the quiet conversations. Maybe she could find out how to behave so that they would definitely take her in. Hey, what are you doing here? 
Wendy shuddered with surprise when she heard a familiar voice. I'm talking to you, Auntie. And at the same second, someone's clinging hand clawed at the woman's dress. Did everyone see that? I've only gone around the corner, and she's already here. Insolent woman. Let me go, asshole. Wendy was spinning around, hoping to get out of someone else's tight grip. Let go, I said. She dodged and bit her tormentor's hand. Hey, she bit me. Are you drunk or something? You're throwing yourself at people. Wendy, breathing hard, brushed her hair out of her face. You could have politely told me I was taking your place. She looked up into the tall man's face. Robert? Yes, it was Robert. Ragged and dirty and smelled worse than a dumpster. See how we met. Crooked, he grinned. All your money went to pay off your debts. I'm in a shelter too. I want to wait out the cold. Well, let's get in line or someone else will come and beat us. They got in line one after another and now they could only hope that they would be able to get into the shelter and find some kind of a roof over their heads, even if only for a short time. And no one in the world cared about them. No one because they deserved it all. Karma? Boomerang? Yes, it was. That was the punishment for two lonely and lost souls.